Let's continue. <clears throat> so the, ne the next uh, topic we wanted to, to talk a little bit about was this. Uh, the way that the BTF is generated for the kernel. And um, uh, this is just, you know, like because I would like to know your opinion about this. Because, and actually, we, we have been talking with Yong Hong now, and there are some things that we were not aware of, and that's the sort of things that is actually useful to come here to realize, right? Okay, so basically, nowadays, as we understand it, when you build a kernel, you build a dwarf, all those gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of, of dwarf. And then there is the, 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 the payhole component in the kernel that generates the BTF from this dwarf. Now, Mm, you, um, that's as far as we know how it works, right? Now, this has the, the, the consequence of introducing a coupling between BTF and DORF in the sense that everything that you want to have in BTF at the end of the chain, it should be expressible in DORF because you have to convey that information through DORF from the C compiler, right? All the way there, all the way there to BTF. Um, this has proven already problematic in some cases because DORF is, is, is very difficult to extend without breaking it, as we have seen with the type tags, for example. Um, I think that is, a, that is a deficiency of the DORF design, and I'm going to propose, you know, this no operation type qualifier so for the future, but... Um, um, if you want to extend DORF, you have to go through the standardization committee. It will be now DORF 6 that who knows when it's going to be published and adapt, adopted by software. I mean, it's a long process. And, um, and also, DORF is very big, and for the kernel, it's huge. It's, 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 it's very big. It's a lot, and it takes time to generate it, you know. So, so we were wondering, um, what if we the duplicate and merge PTF in the linker at link time? Right, like we do with Dorf. Well, Dorf it doesn't get the duplicated. That's one of the problems it has. But um, you know this CTF format, which is Gaussian format to BTF, which is used in different other contexts. In the GNU linker, we already have support for merging it and the duplicating it at the link time. And I think those formats are similar enough that um, probably it would not take a lot of work to to get existing code to the duplicate and merge BTF as well, as CTF. Um, what do you think? I mean, I think this is worth it to have it in the linker anyway. It could be useful, but for this particular use case, I don't know, because John Hong was mentioning that in this chain here, right, from make from the DORF payhole, payhole is getting information from other sources, right, not just the DORF. Uh, yes, actually, payhole will be more than just transform DORF to BTF. It will check the, some Linux sections and uh, try to, for example, per CPU variable, and it will add the global variables from the, uh, uh, the, the VM Linux sections and to the BTF as well, and it will also try to check some uh, functions if the argument uh, is uh, mismatched with the prototype, and some currently will remove that. So a few steps, actually, in Paho, involved with the VM Linux itself, not just Dorf. Okay, so... That means that something like this, oops, will not work? Through Paho works. Yeah, uh, but instead of getting DORF from the kernel build, yes. if it will get BTF, it will get also all the extra information from other sources yeah. and modify it to a final BTF. Do you think this will work? Yes, this should work. You get a BTF deduplicated through Paho process, possibly it will work. So it will work if we extend BTF as well with uh, a, a information about uh, choices, or what compiler optimized and how. Because Pahol checks whether like arguments match, whether this function, et cetera, whether like multiple static functions and they're all the same, then it still emits it. If there are like different static functions different, with different uh, arguments, then it skips it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you think this is doable, taking all those things in consideration? Yep. So this, I think it will be advantages because we will get rid of Dorf in the middle. And uh, yeah, okay, 
good. So I think we will add support. So to the, I to think the you can kernel. sell it to uh, overall kernel community if you quantify this compilation time speed up. Hmm. I think Indu, you was mentioned it yesterday. So CDF, you know, it's it's deduplicated in the GNU linker, and it has this capability that it can represent. It has a parent child. You can uh, represent CTF, sec CTF dic there is a concept called archive in which what you will do is you will have a parent-child relationships. So if you have multiple compilation units and there is a com you identify unambiguous CTF, you promote it to the parent. So there is a way to, um, when you deduplicate, there is a way to reduce the information. If BTF doesn't have this sort of representation, then I think, I mean, I, I'm not clear how deduplication will work very um, seamlessly. But, but, but pay holy it deduplicates with the BTF, I guess, right? It does, yeah, otherwise. And uh, how does it handle the relate, you know, if you have different, uh, because in, yeah, in CTF we have like a container and children, so like a parent dictionary that we call in children dictionaries for the different modules, for example, right? where the same type name could refer to different types. So currently when you deduplicate BTF and you realize that there is a common BTF type across compilation units, then you change the type IDs, right, of the types which are referring to that, which is fine. But then what about the unambiguous types? Sorry, the ambiguous types. By ambiguous types, what do you mean exactly? So like for forward references, they're always ambiguous because they are just like the name of the type. Uh, but for structs with the same name but different layout, then we keep them as is. For uh, forward references, I think we added like very relatively recently, we added like extra pass, like and we see that there is only one forward reference. Uh, actually, if there is only like one potential candidate for the forward reference, we resolve it, I think, as well. But generally speaking, if you have, like we used to have this situation with like, I think, ring buffer. Like we had two different ring buffers across like different C files. Uh, they were like completely different, so we would keep both. Okay, so I think we will pursue this direction then. And I'm glad that there are, you don't see like big problems with this. Um, okay. Now the next question, I know what the answer will be, but uh, I will just, uh, yeah. But it's an interesting aspect, and I think this is challenging. It's very challenging. And uh, I think that this is one of the reasons why this, actually this instruction set and this architecture is, is a special, in a way. In a good way, maybe, I don't know. Um, the thing is, we have a struct BPF ins in the kernel. And this, effectively, this is what mandates and describes the format, the encoded format of BPF instructions. No bats, no house, right? So um, this is part of the UAPA API, and this cannot be ever changed, right, or broken, the backwards compatibility, as far as I can understand. I'm not a kernel hacker, but this is what everyone tells me. Okay, so considering that, and also the fact that in the, the opcodes space in this in, the, in this format is very small, it's just eight bits, right? Um, what has been happening um, is that we are basically abusing, sort of, you know, reusing or using like multi-byte fields in the existing struct or infra-byte fields like the destination and source registers um, as uh, opcodes, and. This has a comp well, complication. I mean, it's a little bit inconvenient because if you have more than one byte in the field, then the NDNS plays a role there. But also, if it's, if it's smaller than, than, than one byte, like the four bit fields, NDNS also plays a role too because the bit fields are actually switched, right? Depending on big Indian or little Indian, by GCC and, and Clang which is basically an implementation dependent uh, behavior, but whatever, it's common enough, right? So, um, 
it's also sort of wasteful because if you use, like for example, this signed division side module here, uh, the opcode is, is three, but then it's using the offset 16 field as an opcode two, right? Then the offset 16 is a 16 bits field in the, in the overall instruction. And if you use that as an opcode, that means that you cannot use you cannot ex uh, use uh, uh, split that field, you know, in other subfields to for other purposes, right? So, I mean, waste wasteful in that sense, and complicated. Well, complicated. It complicates the instruction set because um, depending on the endianess, well, uh, you know, you have to adapt to that. You have endianess dependent uh, instruction opcodes, which is very unusual, you know, when it comes to instruction sets. Now. Um, the, you are all very smart people. You know the kernel upside down, right? So, do you think that there could be a way, some way, somehow, right, to actually evolve this extract in a way that it would be sort of backwards compatible enough so we could have like proper instruction classes? So, for example, let's consider the following. Uh, this is science fiction, what I'm going to show you, right? Because of this UAPI thing, but still, right? So, this will be an ALU instruction that it has the, the normal opcodes for general instructions, but then it has an additional level of opcodes, you know, um, and then some unused bits following. This is the typical classical way in instruction sets to evolve, evolve them. You don't have one single format for instructions, because you don't want to dedicate that many bits for opcodes for instruction that, 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 that for instruction formats that do not need that many opcodes. So that's how it's done, right, hierarchically. So my question is, do you think there could be some way to achieve that and without breaking the kernel somehow? I don't know. I guess the, in the kernel UAPI there are other extracts with similar you see the word situations. We did already, right? You just have a union code two unused with this of right sixteen. Yeah, maybe to use thing. a union there. Yeah, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, that could be. Yeah, it could be. It would be the same thing. Yeah, you don't have to have a separated extract type, but would that work? Sorry, uh, have all the the first field, have all the codes already been used up? Are then like 0, 255 are all used up in PPF? Well, yeah, I don't know. Because because if you could have like 255 be a special one, then you could have it so that it would indicate that it's a special instruction that would have a different um, struct shape. So, so it would be backwards compatible that way. The other thing is that, yeah, we have extensible structs, but that's a, that's a different discussion. But um, yeah, so does anyone know if all the opcodes have been used up or not? Okay, well, I can maybe do a very no. concrete uh, question. No. No, okay. So, if we get this. And, uh, okay, this is going to be very ugly, but whatever. So we keep the 16 bits offset. And then uh, this would be what? Like uh, U8 opcode, uh, code 2 for the additional opcodes and, and use, right? Mm -hmm. uh, will this break the UAPI? It could be, okay, so we, we could add new, okay. Well, the thing is that we have the general opcodes here, right? Which are divided in three, right? I'm always get confused here. Yeah, the class, the, okay. So these are that not That was the question asked earlier. Are all of those being used already in the current UAB API? 
Are they all used? If they're all used, no, there is one free, and they wanted to use it for SDFAN, but they didn't like. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, I think how many we have free? One, right? But it's just an array, right? Or two. But the problem is it's an array, so if you have different. Um, yeah, this is an array. Yes, yeah, so that means you can't just. You, sorry. So because but because it's an array, you can't just have like for one code we have a different uh, sized one. Is the problem right? No. Yeah. Yeah, different size absolutely no way. Right, right, yeah. And we can't have indirection indirection as well, right? Sorry. We have different sizes already. We have eight byte and sixteen byte, so we have infinite space, really. <laughs> Nothing is uh, there is infinite space. Okay, we have eight byte instructions, sixteen byte instructions. We can add thirty two byte instruction, whatever we want. There's plenty of room. We can have like what you're proposing, but it won't be called like struct BPF in a sense. Yeah, right. Struct BPF in a sense too, but sure. So uh, a while ago, uh, in the kernel, uh, when we added a bunch of new system calls, we were faced with the problem of how to uh, make the structs extensible in a backwards compatible way, and uh, we called them extensible argument structs. But basically, the requirement is 64-bit aligned and you need a size parameter. In the system calls, you can pass them separately, but you could also have the size parameter within uh, the struct itself, and then you can have a version struct by size. Every time you add a new field to extend the struct, uh, you bump the size. And then you require that uh, if you pass an old struct, uh, that the additional fields are zero filled, right? Yeah. I'm always getting this wrong. But the additional fields are zero filled, and the kernel will verify this. Uh, yeah, and you can have it backwards and f uh, forwards uh, compatible, extensible. There is a description of this uh, uh, algorithm, algorithm, a description of how this works for OpenAD2 and for Clone3 in the man pages. Okay. If, if, but that's assuming that this is somehow even feasible and uh, that you would require a new struct, BPF instruction 2. But yeah, there are other like schemes to make ALU class of instructions, yeah. Okay. Well, in the mean, I mean, we are implement, we are following, you know, like the new V4 instructions, and we are using the off uh, 16 field uh, as an opcode. But it was just to, you know, to actually uh, take a look at this. That was all. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Um, right. Okay, I will do the the last three, and then you go with the BTF tags, you know, and yeah, so. I, yeah, this will be very fast. Okay, then um, there was an ABA change implemented in Clang um, like a year ago or more, which was that before all the extracts were being passed by reference, but now small extracts are passed by value. And we have to actually adapt to this in GCC. And um, this is our understanding of this, you know, of the, but we have a couple of questions that maybe we can work with Yong Hong later, right? Like, uh, what about packed structs and unaligned fields and um, recursive structs, right? Because it was not clear to us exactly what to do with those. And uh, uh, for the stack one, yes, and uh, we require 16 byte as a boundary. And uh, Yeah. For the unaligned field and the packed structs, I think that we potentially just follow C standard. We didn't do anything special. I well, the x86 P ABI uh -huh. for packed structs and that for a strut that has unaligned fields, it passes it uh, always by reference. OK. So I think we, we, we right. could follow, which is quite prudent because, uh, I mean, it's I think it's a wise decision because, uh, you know, otherwise you get into, um, well, yeah, it gets complicated. Then it's possible BPF also pass uh, by reference for this uh, pack structure on the field. We could, but we will need to agree I, on that. I yeah, yeah, to, check, yeah. I don't, I don't remember. And also, uh, I did not see any of the tests that that were added in this change about the structs that contain other structs. Uh -huh. But are you applying this recursively, or or they are passing them by reference straight away? And for the uh, recursive defined in the same struct, I think so, but. If the struct is uh, separately defined, uh, it's not. Okay, well, so we have to double check. To check and yeah, yeah, uh, explicitly, check. okay. Yeah. Cool. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, fast, rest. Um, yeah, well. Uh, well, that. I mean, um, I don't know a lot about the Rust type system in this sense, but I don't think it is reducible to the C type system. I don't think so. I think the Rust types, they have all sorts of things which are out of the scope of the C type system. So that makes me wonder um, if BTF is going to be able, I mean, it will have to be able, right? Unless the, is the, the same way that there is BPFC, I guess there is going to have to be BPF Rust as well, right? So, and basically I've been wondering lately, now we have Rust C, which is LVM based. As far as I know now, they, they can use the BPF backend. And this is used by Aja, another Rust BPF infrastructure. And Rust, Red BPF, I think it's called, which is another Rust thing that this one, yes, Aya works with object files that you compile with Clang or whatever, but Red BPF, as far as I have seen, it uses the Clang compiler underneath, along with LLVM, to compile Rust code into BPF assembler, uh, op yeah, objects, right, bytecodes. So then I was wondering, what BTF is that thing generating? I don't know. I mean, but we, so I think we need to coordinate on this somehow before it gets out of hand because um, the, the, the LLVM backend, the BTF uh, support in, in LLVM, I guess it is independent of the of the language that is used in the front end, right? Yeah, if I understand it correctly, the Rust C front end just generate IR and then pass everything to the LLVM. And right. The yes. Yes. So we need to take a look about what uh, BTF they are generating for the common Rust uh, data types, and most likely to define a subset or something, because otherwise, I think. I have no idea. No, I didn't try. Well. I will suggest maybe that if, if, if any data structure that is not expressible in current BTF probably is too, is too complex, right? Something like that. I think they also gave a talk about this topic at FOSDEM. Not sure if you... I, uh, yeah, I okay. were there, but I had my own dev room and I could not... Uh, yeah. Yeah, but the recording is there, so it might make sense to reach out because they've been looking into this topic. Yes. So how do you propose to coordinate? Right, that's the last of the, yeah, right, yeah. So, coordination between tools, and because now it's not just Clang and GCC, it's also Rust C, right? It's a third compiler, which is also LVM based, but it's there, right? So, okay, so we have been working, and let's do this fast, I mean, this doesn't need a lot of time. So we have the BPF mailing list. So we get in CC when some, John Home, for example, he's always very nice, and he puts us in CC, you know, me and, or Faust, or when he changes something that is of particular interest of, GCC or compiled BPF. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's, the, this list is so difficult to follow. And um, particularly with people who are, we are tangentially related to BPF, right? So, so I was wondering, well, first about, is there people from the Rust compiler in the, in the BPF mailing list? I have not seen anything of them there. But, and second, I know I hate main, more mailing lists because you know, and I hate overhead. And but it could be that for compiled BPF, you know, for toolchain specific things, maybe we will need a, a separated <laughs> list, maybe where we could have the Rust people, the Clang people, you know, John Hong and and maybe uh, I don't know. I, I have a, maybe a, a side comment or question. Uh, have we thought about doing like BTF types for K pointers, like metadata with a pointer, so that the BTF knows the length? Like, like, so, so I, I, my Rust is rusty. Um, so, like the like GoLang, we have like slices, right? So you have a pointer to like it's not a pointer, but you have a slice. In C, we don't have any notion of a slice per se, but a K pointer is a slice in some sense of that notion. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, the KPTR. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, 
And then that's what I'm, but should they have a BTF type? No? But, but, but how would you program that from C? How would you program a dynamic pointer from C? Yeah, okay, I'll look. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this was about, you know, if whether maybe it would be a good, a good idea to do a separated list for compiled PPF particular issues and, uh, and having the GCC, the Clang people, and also the Rust compiler people in it. Well, that's just, thank you for, for summarizing it all. Definitely we need something, as you pointed out, what we have is not enough. It doesn't work, obviously. Uh, mainly list is huge uh, ITF. Uh, so to answer your question, whether the plan to standardize ABI, yes, PS ABI is in scope for ATF standardization. It, we'll get to it once we're done with ISA, whenever it is. But we cannot wait for this to uh, formalize because, as you pointed out, Rust, IA people, and Red BPF people already doing their own. As far as I know, they, IA folks, they uh, contributed back some of the LVM backend changes, but not not all. They still have like a fork specifically for Rust because they do some fancy linking that somehow uh, LVM linker cannot do. New mainly list, I guess. Should it be in the in Vijar? Like, I guess. Vijar now, so if you folks haven't noticed, we just moved the uh, last week VPF Vijar to Linux uh, LF Infra. So it should be stable now, unlike in the past where we had like mass unsubscribe events twice. So if we we can definitely create a new mini list there. So if you create if someone creates say, this list, we we definitely want to be there. Would be nice, yeah. Okay. Um, then we have this BPF wiki in the GCC wiki that gets uh, uh, it, it. We try to keep everything there, including binutils. And it's possible to subscribe for notification. So if we had a compiled BPF, a compiled BPF uh, list, we could subscribe the list to this wiki, for example, right? So, uh, uh, so just a comment. Um, uh, the Vijer list is a member of the uh, IETF list right now. So it's one is a wider distribution right now, so that you can't actually send some to the IETF list, which won't people that subscribe to Vitra won't get, right? And so I'm just looking forward, right, as Alexi mentioned, uh, PSAPI will eventually be in the IETF. And then if you're going to create a new list, then we may want a similar structure there, whether it's a separate IETF list or a member of the future one when that actually becomes there. In other words, in the future, we could take, you know, BPF at IETF.org and also subscribe whatever the new list is, right? Um, at such point as that becomes relevant. Um, I'd say in the, in, in the short term, the mailing list equivalent from the IETF perspective would be um, the... The, the relevant people that might be on another list would be the equivalent of a design team in IETF language, right? which means it's not part of the standard, it's just people trying to come up with what the proposal would be, and then it comes into the IETF later, and that seems to be the right way that the IETF would view the process there. So I think that any of the different solutions you're talking about would be fine, but I just want to say how that's how it kind of relates to the future, so. Okay. Okay, so. And also in the in the VPF office hours, we already I think we talk about this maybe because we tend to add it all the time, as you, like you can see today. So with those topics, so maybe having one once per month some dedicated to compiled issues in the VPF office hours. Or okay, um, so thank you. And then Faust will say a little bit about the type tags thing because how much do how much time do you need? Entirely, it's not that essential. It's mostly stuff that we need to coordinate between GCC and Clang for the BPF backends. So if you can enumerate them. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I can go through two minutes real quick. Okay, two um, minutes, fair enough. And then we will have your. Do the second one later. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. We have buffer at the end of the day, so it's not that critical that we strictly stick to the schedule. So. Uh, yeah. So. This is just related to the type tags specifically um, that I've been working on in GCC and that we, Clang has support for. Um, <clears throat> but the idea, uh, since I've been working on it, there's a couple of problems that we've 
found, and we discussed these in the B one of the BPF office hours, or two of them, and took all the time, uh, that the dwarf format for the type tags originally was only meant to support pointer types, and we said, well, we should be able to tag any type, not just pointer types, and so we agreed to change the dwarf format to place the type tags as children dies in dwarf of exactly um, the thing that is modified with the type def. Um, but since then, there have been a few more patches to Clang to make the changes that we agreed on and some more things that we've discussed uh, with regards to like how type tags interact with cons volatile restrict qualifiers and importantly, how type tags interact with type defs. And so something that we found is that currently uh, in the BTF loader, if a type has both cons volatile restrict modifiers and type tags associated with it, uh, there's an ordering in force that any type tags come before the CVR qualifiers in the chain. And that's fine, except that the helper function that is used, and this is credit to Edward Zingerman for looking at this, um, this helper function treats type defs also as modifiers. Um, and the problem becomes that it introduces an expectation that type tags should jump over, sort of jump over type defs to the beginning of the chain which means that you end up losing the actual uh, original ordering. So if you have some type def like this, type def int tag one bar, and then two uses of it, in dwarf, in the dwarf representation, by attaching the tag to the int type where, that it applies to, uh, you can sort of use that to reconstruct. You know exactly what sort of declarations it's coming from. But in BTF, if you follow the ordering that the tags should go before modifiers and treat type def as a modifier, then you jump the tags to the beginning and you can't reconstruct necessarily the declaration. Um, so the issue here is that sort of the, the BTF is type is modifier function that is used for enforcing this ordering. Sometimes type defs are filtered out at the call site, but not everywhere. And so it's sort of a question of, should we really just say type defs are not modifiers? And that's something I think that we looked at that would probably be best fixed in the kernel. I, uh, I think the original expectation is uh, uh, type def is always immediately after the pointer before all right. other modifier. So or it works correctly in the current kernel. It just doesn't work with the uh, new format, so in that particular case, it just need to be fixed. The kernel just need to be fixed. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I can, that's not that important. I think just to close things out, the, uh, one of the things that we talked about during the BPF office hours and like the dwarf format stuff was this stuff about uh, the attribute syntax and the association, since type tags are implemented as an attribute, the compiler looks at the attribute and says, okay, what element of the declaration does this attribute apply to? And part of the original motivation was you have sparse attributes that are used in the kernel for like pointers to say this is a pointer to kernel memory or user or whatever. Um, when I was looking at this, we found issues that sometimes in some declarations, sparse would actually associate the attribute differently than when GCC parsed the same declaration, so you couldn't use the attribute, the regular underscore underscore attribute syntax as a direct drop-in for the type tags for replacing sparse attributes. Um, the C2X standard attribute syntax, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with it, but basically it sort of borrows the C++ double square bracket looking attribute syntax, and that is actually more precisely defined in terms of basically if you put an attribute, it always applies to the type that's immediately before it unambiguously which means they don't sort of slide around as the new attributes sometimes do. Um, it seems like that's the best path forward for the type tags. We sort of agreed on it in the office hours, but you have the issue that since it's C2X standard attribute syntax, it's, you know, if, you're use it, if you explicitly specify I'm compiling the kernel with standard equals C99 or whatever, then you can't, you can't use that attribute syntax. So I guess the proposal is that we have Maybe we need to add to the compiler some sort of flag that enables the attribute syntax, and then when you're compiling the kernel with the, the type tags, you can use that. I mean. Are you proposing kind of like STD inference, but not wait? No, I'm, I'm saying we can use exactly the C2X standard attribute syntax, 
But if you're explicitly compiling to an older standard, then the compiler says, I'm, I'm not going to follow that syntax because it doesn't exist. In yeah, but what's the problem if we just, well, pass dash std equal c to x to the kernel? Will it compile or not? So I you mean, say you're saying it just won't compile because of other like C two X things in there, and you won't well, that, just that's, this that's, part. That's of sort the of the standard? question. Have you tried compiling the kernel with C two X? Is there stuff that will break? I mean, can we just compile it with C two X for the sake of type tags? Uh, the the building you always test whether this uh, BTF type tag is supported by compiler or not. So in your case, you can in GCC just say, okay, I support this unless it's uh, like a C two X C twenty three, for example and then it's available, otherwise not available. So I think that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much.